Hi, I'm Kelly Cervantes, and this is Seizing Life, a bi-weekly podcast produced by Cure Epilepsy. Today on Seizing Life, I'm happy to welcome Lucretia Long to the podcast. Lucretia is an advanced practice registered nurse and a certified nurse practitioner at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center. She has been working with epilepsy patients for over 30 years and is here today to inform us on the training and responsibilities of an advanced practice provider and to offer her perspective on the current state of epilepsy care. Lucretia, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to check my notes because I want to make sure I get this right. You are an APRN and a CNP. So for those in our audience who may not know what that um, alphabet soup of letters means, can you uh, explain it to us? Absolutely. So I'm an advanced practice registered nurse and certified nurse practitioner. Really what that means is I'm a registered nurse with advanced experience and education we are trained to uh, not only diagnose and treat patients with acute and chronic conditions, but also to sort of manage patients and families suffering from acute and chronic uh, conditions. Thank you for that explanation. And now your focus is in adult epilepsy care. How did you end up in that specialty? Do you have a, a, a personal connection to epilepsy? So uh, interesting. I have uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Moore, many, many years ago. I've been at Ohio State for a super long time, actually about 30 years. I tell people uh, it was me and, and Jesus who started the epilepsy monitoring unit. That's how long <laughs> I've been uh, But I originally worked as a neurology and neurosurgical staff nurse. And at the time, my um, now colleague, Dr. Moore, was interested in hiring a nurse for the epilepsy clinic. And so he approached me and asked me if I would be interested. And originally I thought you just need to give them Ativan, like why do you need a nurse to do this? And then certainly after I explored um, the field of epilepsy became very um, interested and basically fell in love with the opportunity to care for patients and families with epilepsy. So that's sort of how I my initial experience um, occurred. But I do have somewhat of a personal story. My husband's, um, my mother-in-law had breast cancer that metastasized to her brain and she actually had a seizure. It wasn't epilepsy, it was a seizure provoked by her brain tumor. So I do have somewhat of a personal story uh, in terms of epilepsy. I'm sorry to hear that, but uh, we are so grateful that you did become interested in epilepsy and that the doctor did pull you into the clinic. You know, you mentioned that your focus is with adults. I wonder what kind of um, adults do you typically see in the clinic? You know, is it a wide variety in how they developed epilepsy, you know, either acquired or genetic? How many are um, have developmental disabilities and that sort of thing? Very good question. So I have a really diverse um, patient population. We oftentimes in a tertiary care center will get patients with epilepsy who have been diagnosed for quite some time. So I don't see a lot of new diagnosis uh, with epilepsy. Many of the patients that I see have been seen by either a primary care doctor or a general neurologist, and then they refer them to our center. I would say um, about 30% of patients that I see have what we call a static uh, encephalopathy. So they are uh, developmentally delayed. And, um, but about 70%, um, they look like you and I, you know, of course. And so we have many patients who um, are doing really, really well. And then I have a, a host of patients who are what we call a little more difficult to treat or intractable, where they're not necessarily responding to, to um, pharmaceutical uh, intervention. And so we may need to entertain some non-pharmacologic management, neuromodulation, and other uh, epilepsy surgeries and some of those other treatment modalities. It's interesting. It's a similar percentage, um, I guess, which is what you would expect to hear, you know, is the the rule of thumb or what is, uh, what is out there in the literature is, you know, two thirds are able to have their seizures treated with a first medication and a third are intractable. So it's interesting that that is actually what you see in your clinic as well. I wonder what are your daily responsibilities with your patients? 
Mm -hmm. So my role is in the outpatient epilepsy center. And again, my um, priorities are taking care of patients with epilepsy. So I'll see a patient in the clinic independently. Advanced practice providers are able to uh, manage patients without a physician necessarily being on site. So I have pretty much my own practice, although I collaborate with some epileptologists. And so we uh, basically talk to patients about their clinical presentation. I'm very passionate about patient education. So not only do I implement treatment modalities, but I also am a huge advocate for self-management. And so I do a lot of counseling. We implement seizure action plans. We talk about SUDEP risk reduction. SUDEP is sudden unexpected death. Uh, in patients with epilepsy, and it happens in about one in a thousand adults with epilepsy, but we see a three times incidence of SUDEP in people who have three seizures within a, a 12 month time period. And so I'm really um, very, very passionate about patient and family advocacy and really giving patients the resources that they need to manage this um, diagnosis. I want to go back. You have your own practice, you see your own patients. Um, you said you do collaborate with neurologists. Uh, I, I wonder what that interaction and collaboration looks like and sort of also to that end, what is the difference between um, a patient seeing you versus a patient seeing a neurologist? Yeah, so what we do in clinic is just about the same. Advanced practice providers, we don't read EEGs and we um, we can sort of read MRIs, but we certainly like to collaborate with, in this case, with our epileptologists, also with our radiologists and our neurosurgery um, colleagues as we're pursuing like epilepsy surgery. And so what we do in the clinic is basically pretty much the same. The difference, again, is that we don't read the EEGs, we don't interpret that. And so we work as a collaborative team in those efforts. Um, many advanced practice providers across the country do see newly diagnosed patients with epilepsy and our center is sort of set up for the physician epileptologist to see new patients and then we see those patients and follow up. But certainly we are very um, qualified to do like neuromodulation, to uh, refer patients for resective surgery. And so we work as a collaborative team, but we do sort of practice at the top of our license, which is again, diagnosing, managing, treatment, treating and collaborating uh, with our epileptologists. That's incredible information to know, especially as you know, patients are out there looking for care to know what kind of providers are available to them. You mentioned that one of your passions is patient education. And I wonder, you know, do um, seizure action plans fall into that category? Do you help patients with seizure, seizure action plans? Do you see, uh, because I think a lot of times people think of them mostly for pediatrics, something that the school needs to have or camp or after school care, clubs, whatever. But I think we can agree that they're really important for adults to have as well. And is that something that you work with your patients on? Absolutely. It's a wonderful, a wonderful point. I'm actually on a uh, advisory board and we focus on exactly what we're talking about, the importance of disseminating what we know in terms of research into practice. And so certainly seizure action plans have been used for a long time, predominantly in the pediatric space. Uh, I'm actually working on my doctorate of nursing practice at Duke University and my project is directly correlated with the utilization or increased utilization of seizure action plans in an adult epilepsy clinic. And so I have been grateful to collaborate with some epilepsy experts across the country where we created uh, what I think is a really amazing one page seizure action plan it's nice because it's color coordinated. And, and um, so not only is it nice for patients in that in our practice, we actually hand them out to patients when they're registering so that they can sort of document what their triggers are. Um, and then that patient will speak with the provider, myself or another um, epileptologist, and they'll talk about what the triggers are. We'll go over how to look at seizure uh, emergencies and how to identify those emergencies, how to intervene with rescue medicine, and then we'll talk about when to call emergency services. And it's really important as we look at reducing the risk of um, status epilepticus or those prolonged seizures, and also looking at a risk reduction for SUDEP. So all of these things sort of come into play. And as advanced practice providers, I think we have an amazing opportunity to implement seizure action plans and counseling interventions as it relates to some of these 
um, challenges as we see with morbidity and mortality in this um, group, special population and patients with epilepsy. Can I just say that you are amazing and your patients are so lucky to have you? Because I think that this is... To me, and I, I think to a lot of people who have been in and out of this epilepsy world for years, understand how important this is, but it is so overwhelming to, as a patient or a caregiver, to tackle these issues, to know when emergency services need to be called, to know and and decipher what those triggers are. And having someone who can hold your hand and help you fill out a piece of paper is everything. And, and that can truly save lives and money in ambulance rides and just general safety. It's, it's really remarkable. And I wish that more providers out there provided this sort of counseling. Hi, this is Brandon from Cure Epilepsy. Have you or a loved one been recently diagnosed with epilepsy? Are you looking for more information about epilepsy and available treatment options? Go to cureepilepsy.org forward slash four dash patients to get resources and information about epilepsy. Now back to Seizing Life. I think we have to do a better job as healthcare professionals and really sort of prioritize allowing patients to receive the resource. It's our job to do that, to receive the resources that they need so that they can live uh, amazing lives and to improve the uh, quality of life so that they can go out and do what they uh, enjoy doing. And so I, I love the idea of patients also being advocates. And, and so one of my roles was really to allow that patient to go into that provider and say, I want you to help me with this action plan so that we're empowering patients and families. We um, That's our job. I mean, that's why they come to see us. So I feel that we owe it to them to give them what they need um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I appreciate that, that comment. But my goal is not only to do this at Ohio State. Um, that's a start. And I, again, am on a couple of boards where I'm really passionate about how can we disseminate this information across the board? And um, so not just in Ohio, but across the board, as we look at adults with epilepsy, adults deserve an action plan, as you mentioned, just as um, our pediatric population does. And it really becomes a challenge as a healthcare professional. I can appreciate the time restrictions that we have. And so, again, our job with this seizure action plan was, OK, how can we make this efficient? So we're including the information that's relevant for patients, but also understanding and appreciating the time constraints that um, providers have. And I think we've been really, really successful. We actually published this action plan um, in, I believe it was in epilepsy and behavior. And so we're able to not just disseminate it within our clinical practice, but publish it so that we can, um, you know, educate providers on the fact that we now have something that's time efficient, that can be super relevant uh, for patients and families. And my mind every patient deserves a seizure action plan. I don't care if they're seizure free or they have intractable epilepsy. I think the plan is different for each individual, but every single patient with a history of seizures deserves a seizure action plan. Could not agree more. And I want to dive into something that you just brought up, which is the time that providers have with their patients. And this is something that we hear over and over again um, from patients and caregivers is that they just don't have enough time with a provider and you know the the wait times to get in to see someone can be months and and that's critical time when someone is actively seizing why do you think that is why what is the issue with the constraints there and is there anything that we can do about it yeah, so I think there um, is really quite a bit that we can do about it. And really, the time depends on that provider's practice. So, for example, a lot of the neurology advanced practice providers and physicians who are maybe in private practice, they're going to have a little more time constraints than maybe we do at a tertiary care center. I've talked to a couple of, uh, many actually, of advanced practice providers across the country, and some of them have 15 minutes. Uh, or 20 minutes to see a patient. And in my mind, that's that's not enough time to provide patients and families with what they need. Um, and so in those cases, our goal is to try to give them resources that they need, like the ASAP Acute Seizure Action Plan, so that they can use their time uh, efficiently. But also, um, so in my center, we are grateful that we have um, the advanced practice provider, and I'm the lead outpatient 
advanced practice provider, and I've advocated for us to have a 40 minute um, time slot for all of our return patients. And that gives us enough time um, to sort of give them the counseling information that they need. Um, concern. And we really like to identify not only what we think is important, the um, seizure action plan, obviously compliance and suit up risk reduction, but also to entertain, okay, for you as a client, what is important to you? And what goals can we establish together so we can move forward um, in a collaborative approach to sort of get you where you want to be in terms of your epilepsy outcome. So I think that it really depends on the location you're in. And I'm just grateful in our department that our department chair is on board with the importance of advanced practice providers and what we bring to the table in terms of uh, counseling and giving us the time and resources that we need um, to move forward. The other important point that you brought up is access. And we know um, across the board that there is a decrease in the amount of physicians who are either interested in neurology or applying for that subspecialty. And it may even be across the board, even in primary care. I'm just more familiar with the, the epilepsy and neurology space. And advanced practice providers really serve an amazing role uh, in terms of an opportunity to bridge that gap uh, with access. So on a national level, uh, myself and other people across the country are, are looking at um, epilepsy ad advanced practice provider, really neurology advanced practice provider fellowships, and how can we uh, engage our schools of nursing um, into a collaboration so that those nurses who are coming out are interested and not intimidated by neurology. So we do a lot of precepting, we do a lot of onboarding, um, I collaborate with our uh, College of Nursing and we have students come over to sort of see what we're doing so that we can increase that interest. And I think that will, in a, in a long run, uh, allow us to improve patient access. That is amazing to hear that there are already programs in place uh, and people like you leading them that are helping to bring more people into the field because it is really it is really frustrating. And I know it's it's hard for the practitioners too, because they're putting in all of these hours and, and still the wait lists are long. And so I, I can only imagine how draining that is. You know, sort of back to these topics that so desperately need to be talked about within those uh, clinic appointments. I, you know, I can't even imagine how you get through any of it in 15 to 20 minutes, but, you know, hopefully you get closer to 40 minutes because there are these topics that needed to be discussed, like SUDEP, which I know is something that you are also passionate about educating patients on. Absolutely. Um, and so interestingly, this was, uh, I don't know how many years ago, but I was at the American Epilepsy Society many years ago. And there was a, a, a lady at the table, uh, the suit up table, and I went over to chat with her and she uh, had mentioned to me that her sister had died of suit up and she was very angry, not angry. She was upset that the um, provider didn't tell her and her sister about suit up. And so um, I asked her, well, what do you think would have been different had they counseled and educated you and your sister on suit up? And she said we would have been more compliant with her medication regimen. We would have minimized those triggers uh, for risk recurrence. We would have um, in, uh, made sure that she had nocturnal supervision. And she just sort of laid it out to me. And I thought, wow. And so it really sparked my interest in conducting a study where we surveyed patients and families um, and caregivers, care partners who were um, diagnosed with epilepsy. And I gave them information on SUDEP and basically asked them how they felt about SUDEP disclosure. And it, there were close to 100 patients and caregivers, and 100% of those patients said that it was their right to know about SUDEP and that it was our job to educate them about SUDEP. And so that was really empowering to me. And so I've been on a sort of... Um, uh, cheerleading rampage for trying to make sure that providers are educating patients and families with epilepsy. 30% of people that we surveyed said that that information made them a little more fearful, but 100% of that 30% still said it was their right to know. And then they also indicated that they would be, uh, based on a hearing about that information, they would be more motivated to reduce those uh, factors that can trigger seizures and also be more compliant. And there was a percent of those patients who were now interested in entertaining these non-pharmacologic treatment options 
um, so that we can try to embrace the idea of zero seizures, which is which is always a goal. You know, sometimes we get there, uh, oftentimes we get there, sometimes we don't, but that's always a goal. And so I think that it's not the patient who doesn't want to hear about SUDEP, it's the provider who has challenges with how to present the information on SUDEP. I always tell people it's not really what you say, it's how you say it. And so I was grateful recently to be a part of a consortium where we developed a toolkit um, not just for patients to um, talk to their providers about these tough conversations, but also to provide um, provide healthcare professionals with some resources so that they can learn how to talk about SUDEF. I even in that patient that is seizure free, they still deserve to know about SUDEF. And I typically will approach it and say, keep up the good work with your medication compliance that reduces your risk of breakthrough seizures, life threatening seizures, and SUDEF. So no matter what that patient's presentation is, knowledge is power. And I always tell people that my job is to give you information um, so that we can reduce your risk. So learning about SUDEP shouldn't be fearful. It actually empowers you. So we can work as a team to reduce and minimize those risks. And we certainly know from the guidelines that there are things we can do to reduce the risk of SUDEP. And so it's really about educating healthcare professionals and patients and really giving them the resources that they need so that we can work as a team to reach outcomes for patients and families um, with, with epilepsy. Yes, yes, and yes. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. And um, there is not one piece of that survey you conducted that surprises me in the slightest. People want to know. They have the right to know. And, you know, sort of along the same lines of these uh, more challenging conversations over and over and over again. When I talk to people, mental health and mental illness continue to come up. These, um, you know, high comorbidity rates with people with epilepsy who have anxiety and depression. And, you know, whether it is because uh, the anxiety and depression is caused by the um, situation uh, that their epilepsy puts them in, or if it is, you know, a a biological link in in the brain. Regardless, um, these comorbidities exist. Is that something that you treat in your office that you look out for and offer guidance on? Yeah, so that that is so um, so equally important. So we actually have tools um, that we use to diagnose anxiety and and depression. We we use the generalized. Um, anxiety um, disorder tool. And we also use the uh, NDDIE, which is the Neurological Disorder um, Depression Inventory in Epilepsy. I had to make sure I get the... Get those <laughs> but we screen every patient. So that's a part of their registration paperwork. And based on the outcomes of those inventories, we can then either implement a treatment modality or refer them. And we do have resources, very grateful that we have resources at Ohio State where we can refer them to our neuropsychologists or we have advanced practice providers who specialize in psychiatry. And so typically in my practice, I will initiate maybe a, an initial therapy for depression and for um, anxiety. But if that patient doesn't respond to that initial treatment, then I'm going to refer them over to a colleague so that we can collaborate to make sure their needs are being met in terms of counseling interventions and medication modification, because we want to make sure that they're on appropriate uh, treatments that won't necessarily lower their threshold or cause some other interactions. And so it's a nice, nice process. But absolutely, you're right. Talking to patients about a suicide risk reduction and making sure that we're assessing those things are, are super important. So important. And I'm, I'm so encouraged to hear that that's something that you, that your office proactively is looking for and, and treating. It's so important um, to sort of eliminate that disconnect between the mental health and literal brain health. You have over 30 years of practice in the epilepsy field, which is incredible. I wonder what changes have you seen in epilepsy in terms of care and treatments, the role of providers and, and general epilepsy awareness and knowledge? Yeah, absolutely. I, I always tell people um, that this is a super exciting time um, to be in the epilepsy space. When I first started, 
And I tell people I started when I was three, if you're calculating my <laughs> age. Um, no, but when I first started, we were so limited in terms of treatment options. There were maybe five or six, you know, anti-seizure medicines, and now we have over 30. And so we have these novel medications with different mechanisms of actions, and we're certainly seeing uh, improvements in terms of efficacy and tolerance. And so super exciting uh, from a medication perspective, um, but also we have these amazing treatment options now. We now have three neuromodulation devices. We have laser ablation and all these wonderful surgical procedures. So it um, diet modification is so exciting to be in the epilepsy space. We have so much more that we can offer patients. And as you think about how important hope is, you know, for this patient population, we really, um, I think, have made some amazing progress um, as we look at improving outcomes in patients and families with epilepsy. So this has been so exciting for me to see the beginning of where we were years ago. And now to see all of these opportunities, it's been great. So then as a follow-up to that, on the reverse, where do you see additional help services and progress being needed? Yeah, so I think um, I love the idea, and we're, we're sort of touching on this, um, idea of, of customized care or um, how can we do a better job at predicting what treatment option will work best for one for for what patient and so I think the idea of genetics and how we can incorporate and better understand the different epilepsy is a very diverse um, group as you as you know and so um, I think it will be super exciting if we can continue to move forward in conducting research where we can customize and provide precision care for patients and families um, with epilepsy. I think that's, that's something that we are looking at, but we have a lot of work to do as it relates to customizing care for patients and families. It sounds like we need more research. Absolutely. I think <laughs> we always, not only do we need more research, but we need to be able to appraise that research and then to disseminate it into clinical practice sooner rather than later. There are some experts who suggest that once we've confirmed a treatment modality, that sometimes that information, even though it's published, is not disseminated until many, many years down the road. And so I think we not only need research, but we need to sort of evaluate what's working and then disseminate. And so I think it is a, a process that we're moving forward on, but certainly we have some work to do in that area. Lucretia, you are a wealth of knowledge. You have been an absolute delight to speak with, and we are just so grateful that uh, you are able to carve out some time to talk to us today. Thank you so much. I'm just grateful to be here. I'm delighted to have this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lucretia, for sharing your vast experience and knowledgeable perspective on epilepsy care with us today. As Lucretia noted, the past 30 years have seen an explosion in epilepsy medications, technology, and knowledge. Cure Epilepsy has been at the forefront of research that has fueled many of these advances in epilepsy treatment, but there is still much to do to achieve our goal of a world without epilepsy. If you would like to help us reach this goal, please visit cureepilepsy.org forward slash donate. Cure Epilepsy, inspiring hope and delivering impact. Thank you. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Cure Epilepsy. The information contained herein is provided for general information only and does not offer medical advice or recommendations. Individuals should not rely on this information as a substitute for consultations with qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with individual medical conditions and needs. Cure Epilepsy strongly recommends that care and treatment decisions related to epilepsy and any other medical conditions be made in consultation with a patient's physician or other qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with the individual's specific health situation.